If you've been reading your Bible for some time growing up maybe in a church, then the story of Abraham will probably be familiar to you. Since we're looking at some of the great women of the scriptures this morning, we'll be looking at Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, Abram, whose name would later be changed to Abraham, became the faithful follower of the faithful people of God. Although, to be completely honest, they weren't all that faithful all the time, and neither was Abraham, so it seems. One such embarrassing incident is recorded in Genesis 12, right on the heels of God's calling to Abram to leave the country, his home, trust God with his future. He does it. But right after that, when Abram and his wife Sarai went to Egypt to escape the famine in his own home, he figures his beautiful wife might get him killed as one of the Egyptians just might find her attractive and dispose of him to take her. So he says to her, tell them you're my sister, which is partially true. You'd have to read that. She did it, just like he figured. The officers of Pharaoh told Pharaoh how beautiful she was, and Pharaoh took her for himself. And he treated Abram very well and made him rich, but God cursed Pharaoh and his household with some serious diseases, and so he brings Abram in to say, why did you tell me she was your sister? Or she, why did you tell me she was your sister when she was your wife? And sends him away. Well, it's, a, it's an embarrassing moment took a pagan king who did not know God to confront the man of God lying because it looks like he did not trust God to protect them. Not a great day for Abram, not a good example for his wife or anyone else who might have known the story, including us here. He come to chapter 15, God reiterates the promise, gets more specific with Abram and having this son of promise that he inherited, he would inherit it along with a land for his people, and God seals the covenant with him. You can read it for yourself, but we come to chapter 16, and we start getting to know Abram's wife, Sarai, just a little bit more. Since God had promised Abram a son and his wife was barren, could not have children, Sarai decides to remedy the situation with a frankly surprising suggestion, go sleep with my servant Hagar. And the reason, as it says, perhaps I can build a family through her. Just as Abram must have lacked some faith when he told his wife to lie, now Sarai must have lacked some faith when he told her husband to produce a baby with her own servant girl, figuring maybe God just couldn't do what he said he could do. Both ideas for the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, Abram and Sarai, must have seemed logical at the time. But neither were trusting in the God who can do the impossible. Sarai's idea does produce an heir of Abram, but it's not the production as God wanted it to be. And what it produces really is more heartache for Sarai. It gets worse, not better. Ishmael is born. He's not the son that God promised. His mother, Hagar, as soon as she discovers she's pregnant, becomes a thorn in the side of Sarai. She despises her woman. At some point, then, she turns to Abram and says, You did this to me. You did this to me. Abram lets his wife do as she pleases, and she mistreats her servant, Hagar, so much that Hagar runs away. And I'm just guessing that might have been one of the lowest points of Sarai's life, and Hagar could say the same thing. God saves the day, shows grace to both women, and blesses both sons, he will. I don't think the story right there so far speaks very well of Abram or Sarai, but thankfully the story doesn't end well. God speaks to Abram again in chapter 17. Now he's a weathered, older, 99-year-old man, and he confirms his promise to him. He changes his name to Abraham since he will become the father of many nations. And listen to what he says about his wife, chapter 18, 17, starting at verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you no longer will be calling her Sarai. Her name now will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Now, how does a great man of faith respond to such news? Abraham fell face down and he laughed. 
And he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. That's, that's quite a response. God says, Abraham, listen to me. You will be this. She will be this. And Abraham in great faith says, <laughs> Seriously, I don't know if he was hiding it, choking it in, not letting it slip out except through a burp and out of his nose, but it's embarrassing. He laughs. He thinks how crazy this must be. God's saying this to two old people, so a 100-year-old and 90-year-old will have a son when neither one of them logically, physically, relation, uh, really can have a son. And, and under his breath almost, he just says, and, and I, just, I just wish you'd work through Ishmael. We already got a son. Work through Ishmael. God is so patient with Abraham, the one who laughs at the unbelievably good news. And he hasn't left Sarah out either. We haven't left her behind. The next chapter describes God visiting both of them in their tent so that this time even Sarah can hear it for herself. And this is how it goes as the Lord here in the flesh, as these heavenly visitors have come to Abraham and Sarah, she listens in the tent. Listen to this, chapter 18, starting in verse 10. One of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. He already heard that. Maybe she hasn't except through Abraham. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. She had never born a child yet. And now too old. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. It's almost like God is working against them. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Where did Sarah learn to lie? Probably where she learned to laugh at the Lord's promise of making the impossible possible. Abraham was a terrible husband in some ways. Bad example for his own wife. Wife told her to lie. So they both learned to lie. And they both learned to laugh at the face of God as he tells them what is crazy to believe. But God did the impossible just as he promised and kept promising. He reminded them every day in their old age until their death that they laughed by naming their child the son of promise laughter, which is what Isaac means. It's interesting how little we know of this woman named Sarai changed to Sarah. We know she's beautiful. She must have been strikingly beautiful. And everybody knew it. Not just her husband, a man who says, yeah, you're beautiful, baby. Everybody would have seen her beauty. She was the princess in a way as she was raised to be, as her name implies, probably treated as such. You know how beautiful women are honored, even in our culture. She wasn't just beautiful, though, as a young woman. It looks like she held on to that into her old age because that's when we first get to know her. She's already old and still very beautiful. As MacArthur points out, about the time people in America start retiring, that's when we first start learning who Sarai is. She's 65. That's when things start moving, at least in the spiritual world. That's when we learn to admire her from the beginning, not just for her beauty, but for her character and commitment. Even as Abram says, everybody pack up, let's go. They leave their home and follow the Lord's calling to somewhere. Sarai doesn't just complain or argue, not at all. It, it appears as if she's not even dragging her feet. She follows willingly, gladly, maybe enthusiastically. Well, you can read Sarah's story if you'd want. But before we end, let me just point out a few things maybe we can learn from this woman. 
Number one, learn from your mistakes. Maybe you've heard the story about the young man who was appointed president of the bank. And he was young. And he knew he was young. He knew he probably didn't deserve the honor, but he was overwhelmed and honored by it. So he decided very early to approach the older and wiser chairman of the board to get some advice. So he asked the older man, some advice, please. And the old man just says two words, right decisions. I know. I mean, how do I learn? Right decisions. The young man pleased to hear that, but was hoping for so much more. So he said, well, that's helpful. I appreciate it. But can you be more specific? How do I make right decisions? The wise man simply responded, experience. The young man heard that, but still didn't get enough. He wanted more. So he said, well, yes, yes, that's why I'm here. I don't have experience that I need. So how do I get more experience? The reply this time is wrong decisions. Hey, the truth is we all make wrong decisions. All of us make mistakes. We are reminded in the scriptures and in the stories of all of these women we've studied, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't act like it's not true. We will all make wrong decisions. We have blown it in the past, and without being a prophet, I can safely say you will blow it in the future. Our mistakes, our sins have plagued us and will continue to trip us up. It's not the mistakes, though. It's not the errors of judgment. It's not really the wrong decisions, not even the sins that set us apart. It is what we do with them that makes all the difference in the world. Neil Rosenthal says, view your mistakes as valuable teachers. <coughs> mistakes give us feedback. With every misstep or error that you make, ask yourself, what is the lesson in this mistake? What can this teach me? And then he says, everyone makes mistakes, but don't let your mistakes define you. You don't have to be a spiritual person to come up with something like that. Anybody in the world can use words like that. But there's another level to this that a person who thinks spiritually must come to. And sometimes it takes a really major mistake to really understand what God can do in your life and probably is doing in the moment if you would just open your eyes. It happened to Chuck Colson. I don't know if you know his story. In 1974, as he was already at the apex of his political game, he was a top aide to President Richard Nixon. And he rose to the top with great enthusiasm and in some ways a cutthroat mentality. He had once boasted that he would walk over his own grandmother to get what he wanted. He'd been known as a dirty trickster, a hatchet man. But it all came crashing down with this word that we have come to say, Watergate. And if you're younger, you might have to go research what happened there. But as a result of all of that, he voluntarily pled guilty to obstruction of justice on a related charge and served seven months in a minimum security prison. But that mistake that led him down this road, that experience that ended him up in chains, really, behind bars, it changed him forever. He had this awakening along the way. He did some spiritual inventory in his life, and he decided it was time to make this life-defining decision. And from then on, from that moment on, he decided to live his life the best he could for Jesus. And he got out, and in 1976, founded something you may know is called Prison Fellowship to minister to those behind bars still. Listen, listen to what he said in his book, Loving God. The real legacy of my life was my biggest failure, that I was an ex-convict. My greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. He chose the one experience in which I could not glory for his glory. Chuck Colson learned from his mistakes and lived the rest of his life trying to honor God. I assume Sarah did the same thing. What about you? You don't have to tell me you've made mistakes. Obvious. You don't even have to tell me what they are. I suspect I could figure them out at some point. They're embarrassing. They're shameful. You're guilty. You did it. Maybe they're the biggest ones the world has ever known. It doesn't even matter. You know what matters? What have you learned from it? Will they defeat you and define you or will you allow them to teach you and humble you and reshape you so you can live a better life for the Lord from that moment on? 
Number two, be honest about your own faithfulness, which is not always so faithful. Here we are, people of faith, sitting in church. You want us to get honest about our faith? We are the faithful of the Father, the hope of the world, the ones who embody faith. We say it, we sing it, we pray it, we love it, we live it. But can we be honest? We are sometimes a mixed up people full of faithfulness and faithlessness at the same time. And I think one of the best things we can do is just be honest. Let's at least start with that. I think the world would love to hear us say it. Others around us should be hearing it. God needs to know it, but he already knows it. He needs you to know it. One of the best statements in the Bible that I have come to love, it's kind of a prayer said right to Jesus. One of the shortest, honest truths I've come across that has really changed me in some ways. One time there's this man who says something to Jesus. It's in Mark 9. It's a father, and he has a son that he loves, but he's plagued by this spirit, this evil spirit. And so he brings the son to Jesus for healing, and he uses these words, if you can. Jesus replies, if you can, if everything is possible for the one who believes, and there's where the father of the boy says back, I do believe, help my unbelief. And that statement is so much like me, maybe like you too. I do believe. I'm here to tell you publicly and boldly, I believe. But can I be honest? There are times when I have trouble believing. Watch my actions if you could see my thoughts. Sometimes when the trouble comes, I have trouble. And we get hit and we're knocked down and laid low with words like layoff or stock market crash or divorce or cancer or death. And while we still believe, holding on to the thread saying, I believe our belief takes a hit. And it is mixed with a level of faithlessness. It's honest and at times... I think we just need to say it too. I believe, Lord, just help my unbelief too. Sarah was not just faithful or faithless. She was at both times both, sometimes both. Just like her husband, she lied. She deceived others. Just like her husband, she had trouble believing the promises of the Lord. Just like her husband, she laughed when she heard the ridiculous claim, a promise that she would bear a son. At the age of a grandmother already. But despite all of that, she never really let go of her faith. She still believed. She held on to him and what he said. She was, in the whole scheme of things, ultimately faithful. <coughs> Which brings us to the last one. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. We like to define ourselves and survey our own history and decide what kind of a person we are. Huh, what kind of a person am I? We rank our sins and our successes and put them on this timeline and try to figure out where we were up and where we were down. And we try sometimes to determine the worthiness of our lives. But how about we just let the Lord do that? There was something special about Sarah. She was as messed up maybe as any human being could be, but she lived a life of faith and she didn't let go of that. And if you wonder how her old life in the Old Testament ends, it ends very normally. She died. <laughs> Even in death, though, it is, it is a little surprising because, as Dean puts it, Sarah is the only woman in the Bible whose age at death is recorded. Significant. So if you're wondering how her story ends, since we know very little about her whole life in the Old Testament, how about just look in the New Testament at how she is mentioned. She's mentioned in 1 Peter 3, 6, Romans 4, 19, Romans 9, 9, and Hebrews 11, 11. Since the two middle ones are really just in passing, as Paul would say it to the Romans, let's look at the other two. 1 Peter 3, 4 to 6, Peter's encouraging the Christians, the wives, to submit to their husbands, be examples of godliness to him, especially to the unbelieving husbands, that maybe in their example they could bring their husband to faith. And in saying that, he writes, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty 
the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's eyes. For this is the way the holy women of the past put their hope in God and used to adorn themselves with such. They submitted themselves to their husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham, called him Lord even. You're her daughters if you just do what is right and don't give way to fear. By the way, he goes on to speak to husbands too. He's not picking on the wise. But Sarah must have been beautiful, but her beauty went all the way to the core. You didn't look at the outside and say, wow, she's beautiful. You said, do you know what she's really like? Because she is a woman of beauty. All the way to the middle, in her inward soul, she's beautiful inside and out. She's admired for the way she submitted to her husband. She, she did what was right. She never acted in fear for the most part. In Hebrews 11, as the inspired writer gives the list of those who live their lives of faith, he speaks of these men, often these men, and sometimes a few women. And Abraham, he says, the faithful follower of the faithful, gives the highlights of his actions in faith. And he writes too in verse 11, And by faith even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because, here it comes, because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And here's where we come to the significance of Sarah. Sarah's mentioned because of her faith, but pay attention to the last line because the point is not so much her faith, it's the object of her faith. This is what sets Sarah apart. She's complimented and applauded for putting a faith in the right spot, in the right place. Her faithfulness is being admired, but it's more than that. It's her choice, her decision, her commitment to trust the one who is fully faithful. Reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.13, which is not about Sarah, but about Jesus and all our put their faith in the Lord. And Paul says, if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, he'll reign, we'll reign with him. If we disown him, though, he'll disown us. And if we're faithless, and he doesn't go on and say, then he'll be faithless. How could he say that? He says, if we're faithless, oh, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. The relationship between us and the Lord is responsive. The Lord acts toward us in some ways the way we act toward Him. He responds to us accordingly. But notice how it ends. Even if we embarrass ourselves and Him, even if we disown Him, even if we respond so poorly, it is embarrassing. It is shameful. Even then... Even then, the Lord is faithful, always faithful, nothing but faithful. And that's why Sarah chose so well. She wasn't perfect. She was far from perfect. She was beautiful. She was obedient. She was faithful. You could consider her a woman of faith, even when it really wasn't all the way through her life. But what she did well, she really did well. She chose the Lord who had chosen her. She stuck with the Lord who stuck with her. She believed the Lord when He promised her. She stayed with her God and held on to her faith, and she would not let go. And considered Him worthy. Because he was faithful. With all of her faults, she knew that the Lord was faithful. And if nothing else, if she would just stick with him, she could trust him for his faithfulness. And she did. And he was. We all want to be faithful this morning. But if you want to be honest with yourselves and with the Lord, tell him you've been faithless. Ask him to help you in your unbelief. But as a goal, be faithful. Just be faithful. Jack Wellman asks, what, what will be the one thing that people will remember about you, say about you after you're gone? Will it be, wow, he had a nice car collection. She was really a good businesswoman. She was a great cook. He was one of the best mechanics I knew. They had a great sense of humor. They reached level 10 in Candy Crush. There has to be more. I won't be at my own funeral. If I'm there, I won't really be there. If you see my body, that won't still be me. 
But if by some miracle I could hear what was said that day, I would care to hear one thing and one thing only. If they wanted to go over all of my faults on that day at my funeral, they could and it would take way too much time, so don't waste your time. But if they could say one thing that was true, I would want them to say this, if it were true, he was faithful to the end. He put his faith in Jesus, considered the Lord trustworthy, judged that God would save him. I want to be able to say like Paul on my last day on earth, I fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Despite my faithlessness, I want to be faithful in the end. But it doesn't really matter what I say at the end. It doesn't even matter what you say at the end. What really matters is just one thing that is said at the very end. And I'm certain Sarah lived her life so she could hear these words. And I want to live my life so I can hear these words. And if you can't live your life in order to hear these words, then it's a good day to change your life. Because here are the words that I want you to hear too. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's stand and sing. Come if you need to.